So let us begin our worship with a message of hope found in Isaiah chapter 40. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Our first hymn this morning reminds us that as we gather together for worship, Jesus is always with us. So let us join together in worship by singing through twice hymn 197 as we are gathered. That is hymn 197. Has come together in prayer to thank God for the hope he brings. Let us pray. Gracious and giving God, today we come before you in grateful thanks for all that you promise to provide to all who will listen and follow. Our worldly understanding of the definition of hope leaves things to chance. Unlike your promise of hope, which is a promise, the hope of better things to come. Yet, as we go through our daily lives, we sometimes look for instant solutions or change. Let us instead look to you for what we have to do to be an integral part of your message and promise of hope for mankind. In gratitude, we give thanks for the sacrifice you made in giving the life of your son, so that we might live in harmony with you beyond our earthly life. In gratitude, we give thanks for all that our world can provide, the air we breathe, the water we can drink, the environment we can live in. Let us keep your hope alive that we look after your resources so current and future generations can enjoy all that you have provided. In gratitude, we give thanks for the freedom to worship where and how we wish, without fear of persecution or humiliation. Thank you for the promise that where two or three are gathered, you are there also. In gratitude, we join together in prayer, sharing the prayer taught by your Son, Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. To set the scene for looking out in hope, Mary is going to read Ephesians chapter 1. I, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time together, sorry, of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put his power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Thank you, Mary. When, during a Kirk session meeting in late autumn, it was agreed that members of session would continue to lead the first service after Christmas, it was initially thought we would follow a traditional lessons and carol service. My thoughts changed, however, whilst taking part in an online chat through, churches, through the Church's Sanctuary First online group, where they were talking about the up-and-coming November theme, Legacy of Hope. That was the theme for this online community. I immediately thought that this could perhaps be a theme that we could follow in 2023. We have, as a church family, been through quite a tumultuous time since January 2020. But we are still here 
and through God's promise of hope, we are still able to worship together and build a plan for our future. Hope is a rich, transforming thing. Hope for us is not optimism or foolhardiness or even a denial of reality. Our hope is knowing that the deep love at the heart of the universe is God. He loves us and he cares for us. This legacy that Paul is explaining to the Ephesians is as relevant now as it was then. God, he has chosen each one of us as his child. We can have redemption and our sins can be forgiven. It is truly a legacy of hope. We are marked with the seal of the Holy Spirit. In the dictionary, it says that a legacy is a gift or a bequest. Sometimes we look at what the legacy of a major event will have. For example, as part of the UK's bid to host the 2012 Summer Olympics, the legacy that they hoped would leave, would, that they would leave would be to ignite participation in sport and job opportunities across the United Kingdom. The Games certainly brought many people together and inspired some to take up a sporting activity. In our context then, what should our bequest or pitch be to provide a legacy of hope for others? One thing is for sure, it cannot be kept to ourselves. The hope God is offering is not part of an exclusive members club where fees are unaffordable for many. His hope is for all and is freely given, but it has to become known about. That is where you and I come in. What are we going to do this week? next week and continue to do to let others know about the hope God is offering. Who are you and I going to share it with? Now, God doesn't ask us all to be preachers, but we can all be teachers. A teacher is merely someone who shares what they know with another. And we also give them the tools they need to go and gain more knowledge and understand ev understanding to eventually to be able to do it independently. They lead by example, taking what someone already knows and build on that. We've all done it. Maybe as a parent, a relative, a neighbour or a work colleague, we have all been teachers telling and showing someone something that they didn't know and they can now do it. So we can all carry out kind acts in the name of Christ. Remember, as is quoted by Matthew in chapter 25, Jesus told his disciples that when whatever was done for the least in society was done for him. To continue God's legacy of hope, we have to start and continue to show God's message through our words and deeds. We have to engage with those who don't yet see that the hope on offer is there for them. Amen. As we sing our next hymn, let us think about where God might be sending each one of us in the near and distant future to share and build on his legacy of hope. Let us join together in singing hymn 251, The Lord of Sea and Sky, hymn 251.
set the scene for the next part of our service, Lynn is going to read from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Thank you, Lynn. When working in education, I remember being told and also telling others the only constant in education was change. The fundamental rules don't change. Two and two will always be four. The rules of spelling don't change. But how they may be taught or explained has changed. How I was taught to read, write and count has fundamentally changed. So much so I can't remember how to do take away unless I do it the way I taught it. I was fortunate that I picked up the basic rules and conventions fairly smoothly whilst at primary school. So I had little experience of those who found it more difficult. It wasn't until I found my way into teaching that I saw that there were lots of different learning styles. In fact, I was in my 20s before I realised what my best way of learning was. And I realise now that not everyone learns in the same way. We all hear say sometimes, it wasn't like that in my day. The young these days, and so on and so on. But is there such a thing as the good old days? We sometimes look back with rose-tinted glasses and we have to remember that with lots of technological advance advances, life can be better for many if used properly and humanely. Not many of us will be watching television on the same screen as we did as a child. Now, I'm not suggesting that we throw the baby out with the bathwater or bring about change just for the sake of it. But sometimes change is required. In the Gospel of John, read by Lynn, we heard Jesus explaining to his disciples that if a branch bears no fruit, the vine will wither and perish unless the vine grower removes or prunes the branch. It is our job to bear fruit so the vine can continue to provide and produce. Our role is to keep the legacy of hope alive and developing. And we can only do that by following him and following his commandments. In order to bear the fruit, we have to keep things relevant and open ourselves up to doing things in new or better ways. If we don't prune and nourish, then we will perish. Now that's not to say we have to start anew. The fundamentals, just as in education, don't change. 
God's message of hope hasn't changed. Our job is to find the best way to share that good news in a way that those who have forgotten it or haven't yet heard it understand and are able to engage with it. Presbyteries up and down the land are currently looking at how to engage with different audiences. People live busy lives and work differently to how many of us did when we set out in our careers. So Sundays just blend into the rest of the week and many are required to work. So how do we offer God's word to those where Sunday is a regular day of work? Can we perhaps offer a service on another day of the week? Some feel they don't have the right clothes to wear to come into our building or are worried about following the right convention. Can we offer a more informal style of worship? Does the worship have to be what some see as the hymn sandwich? Can we offer more of a, a round table chat? How do we engage with the unemployed? The homeless person who we may see on the high street, the asylum seeker who may have limited understanding of English as a language, the young parent trying to build up a child on their own who can't afford childcare costs to enable them to look for a job. The alcoholic who hides their pain through the bottle. All of these individuals and groups live amongst us. How do we ensure the legacy of hope is living for them? There is a phrase used when talking about child, child protection and it is, it is everyone's responsibility. No one should say, but it wasn't part of my remit. The same should be said about keeping the legacy of hope living. It is all of our responsibilities to make sure we are working with the vine grower to enable the vine to bear fruit. Leaving Parish Church can provide and enable the vine to bear fruit if the members feed the vine and help the fruit to be born. If not, we'll wither and die. We owe it to the people of Leaving to make sure that doesn't happen. We must remember, though, that we are not on our own. As Moses reminded Joshua, as written in chapter 31 of Deuteronomy, it is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not be afraid. <coughs> Amen. Our next hymn reminds us that the house of God is for everyone and all are welcome. We cannot judge how others present themselves if they are brave enough to venture in, be that at a Sunday service, a coffee morning, a church group or a fundraising effort. So keep that in mind when we're singing hymn 198, Let Us Build a House Where All Can Dwell, hymn 198.
is now going to lead us into part three of our service with a reading from John chapter 4, verses 1 to 15. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard, Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized. He left Judea and started back to Galilee, but he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink from of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be th thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Joanne, we need water to live. Without it, nothing can survive. Water keeps our bodies working well and helps us to stay fit and healthy. We see all too clearly through our news channels what happens to crops when there is a drought and the devastation it causes to many, especially in the developing world. In the reading that we have just heard, Jesus and his disciples had been travelling for some time and he was probably weary, tired and thirsty. We know he and his disciples were in need of sustenance as we are told his disciples had gone into town to fetch food. It is important, as I have said, that we keep ourselves fit and healthy as much as we can by making sure we keep hydrated. hydrated. But is it merely keeping hydrated that Jesus is talking about to this Samaritan woman? She was astonished enough that Jesus spoke to her in the first place, as this was very unusual. But when she asked him a question, she was confused by his answer. She knew living where she did that water was vital, but she had never heard of living water. What on earth could this man be referring to? Now, Jesus at this point does not explain what the living water is, but the woman has heard and understood enough that she knows this Jew is offering something different and worth exploring. We have come to understand that Jesus is referring to the living water as the Holy Spirit, as he explained to a crowd during a festival in Galilee, which we read about in John chapter 7. It is through the Holy Spirit that we gain the full understanding of what life in all its fullness means. Now, 
Life can throw curveballs at any time. None of us are immune to challenges, sorrow or heartache. It is in these times that our faith holds us close to Jesus through his Holy Spirit. We draw from the well and receive strength to work through the trials, knowing that he is holding us together and that hope is all around us. A poem that I'm sure lots of us know is a poem called Footprints in the Sand by Margaret Fishback Powers, and I think it sums it up well. One night I dreamed a dream. I was walking along the beach with my Lord. Across the dark sky flashed scenes from my life. For each scene I noticed two steps of footprints in the sand, one belonging to me and one to my Lord. When the last scene of my life shot before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. There was only one set of footprints. I realised that this was at the lowest and saddest times of my life. This always bothered me, and I questioned the Lord about my dilemma. Lord, you told me when I decided to follow you, you would walk and talk with me all the way. But I'm aware that during the most troublesome times of my life, there is only one set of footprints. I just don't understand. When I need you most, you leave me. He whispered. My precious child, I love you and will never leave you, never ever during your trials and testings. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. We will always have the legacy of hope that we are never on our own. We are being carried when we need him most. Amen. As this reflection focused on water, I thought I would take the opportunity to choose my favourite hymn, Hymn 550, As the Deer Pants for the Water. So let's join together now and sing Hymn 550. <laughs>
reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23 to verses 33 to 43, lots of threes, and Peter is going to read it to us now. They came to the place that is called the skull. They crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And the people stood by, watching, but the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There are also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not? Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And when indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into the kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Thank you, Peter. The focus for the past few weeks in the church has rightly been on Advent and the time of waiting patiently for the coming of the Messiah. A joyous time where we focus on what Jesus' arrival meant for mankind and the importance of focusing on what is truly important in life. Now, for some across the globe, that celebration has yet to take place, as their focus is on the arrival of the Magi and their announcement of the birth of Jesus. The death and resurrection of Jesus is a much more difficult concept for those outside the church to grasp and buy into. There is far less of a focus in society on what it is all about. Commercially, it is an opportunity to sell chocolate. But how many understand the symbolism of the egg itself? Some link it to the season of spring and the things coming to life again after the long, dark winter. However, not all climates across the globe are celebrating Easter in springtime, so this is a modern convenience. It does, however, help to explain to children in our schools the concept of new life, which Christians believe Easter gives us the opportunity to attain. It is through Christ's death and the resurrection that the legacy of hope is derived from. Without Jesus' death and resurrection, there would be no hope of receiving the living water. The passage reminds us the cruel way in which Jesus died and the mocking that he had to endure as he was nailed to the cross. Yet he knew this had to happen and even at this time he was able to forgive those who had sentenced him to death and offer eternal life to the criminal next to him who realised that Jesus offered a new way of life. It is never too late to accept the living water that Jesus and the Holy Spirit offer. All we have to do is ask and we will receive. Matthew relays this in chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, telling us, Jesus, telling us that if we ask, it will be given to you. Search and you will find Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks, receives. 
and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. This is our greatest legacy of hope. In 2023, let's share this with others and not keep it to ourselves. Amen. Let us join in prayer. God, the giver of life, thank you that even on the cross, your son was able to forgive what was being done to him, knowing that we would then be able to share in the legacy of hope. There are many in our society who have yet to learn or accept this legacy of hope. Be with them now and find a way for their hearts to open up to the opportunity that is being presented to them. In this new year, may those in power locally, nationally and internationally listen to you and enable them to make the correct decisions so that the lives of their citizens are made better because of the choices they have made. We also ask that we take the time to look at ourselves and the choices we make. May we look to you and the choices you expect us to make and the opportunities that may be presented to us to spread the word about the promise of hope you offer. Let us all do what we can individually and collectively to make 2023 a positive year for your kingdom and all that live in it. We give thanks for the offerings the members of our church community give week by week. May these offerings be used wisely to further your work here in Leaven and where possible beyond. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Our closing hymn today is hymn 192, All Our Hope on God is Founded, followed by our closing prayer. Let us join in singing hymn 192.
Father's hand keep us from stumbling. The footprints of Jesus give us confidence to follow. And the fire of the Spirit keep us warm and safe in our walk with God each day.